Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. As we're coming on live here, just gonna give it another minute for everybody to get notified that we're here, that we're live. Um, I don't wanna customize my dashboard right now because I wanna be live in my group. Why? Um, if you're seeing this, what in the world? I'm gonna make sure this is happening. Oh gosh, okay. All right, yeah, let me know if you're here. It says I've been live for 10 minutes, so now I'm confused. But hi, I see people watching, so tell me uh, who you are, confirm I'm not insane in that this is here and this is happening. Um, what we've been doing in the beginning of these Tuesday Talks is saying not only who you are, but where you are, both physically and emotionally. Hi, Marietta. So, so who are you? Where are you? I'm in Arizona. And where are you emotionally? And right now, I'm uh, having kind of a funny moment because as I'm about to talk to you about life poor core, I'm going to probably have to do some of it on this call and you'll find out more about, or on this um, live, so you'll find out more about what that means in just a moment. But as you're tuning in, give me a hello down below. Who are you and where are you both physically and emotionally? So location and what's going on in your body today for you and for your life. And to get started, we've been opening with either poem or meditation that has been the last couple of weeks. I said today I'm starting with a poem, and so I'm doing it. And it's a short one, but I will uh, do that to open us. So this is Our Real Work by Wendell Berry. It may be that when we no longer know what, we, what to do, we have come to our real work. And that when, when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. And again, that's Our Real Work by Wendell Berry. And obviously I'm having a time talking today, so that's fun. So I'm going to open with a definition of what we're talking about today in this life parkour um, Tuesday talk so that when I move into examples in my story of my camping trip this weekend, you understand what I'm getting at. It's not just like a, a wild story, wild chaotic story. So let's define parkour. It is a sport where you rapidly move through an urban setting using all the man-made structures or obstacles as part of your course. So you might see people doing this jumping off of walls, hurtling over light posts and guardrails. And please give me other examples if you have seen this happen, if you've seen parkour happening. I think it was kind of popular when I was in high school or in college, so like 10 years ago. I'm not really sure if it's still a thing. I think it was just starting then. Um, and friends would make fun of it, probably poorly. You know, we're not parkour people. We just kind of kick off of something, jump on a stump or something, and yell parkour. Did anybody else have that experience? I want to know like what your familiarity is with parkour as I'm talking about it. And you can always comment, comment here below. So I'm reading this book called Play Anything by Ian Bogost. I want to say Bogost, I'm going to say his name is. And I'm reminded very much of parkour. So Play Anything is a book about using life's limitations and obstacles instead of getting upset about them. And one quote that stands out in my head that I couldn't find the exact wording for today is something like, take the limitations and the obstacles in life that are not inherently meant for your pleasure or your play and then treat them as if they were. This is also kind of like improv comedy, right? It's a yes and. It's like, all right, this is here and what am I going to do with it? And that's so similar to parkour, right? Because those man-made structures in a city have an entirely different purpose and they were not created with the athlete in mind. And yet the person who engages in parkour treats it as if it were an obstacle course built just for them, right? Oh my gosh, Gina, you haven't heard of parkour? I wonder if it's just like not a thing anymore. 
because it used to be a big thing. Not, yeah, I don't know. So anyway, a lot of times we like to, um, we like to see obstacles and limitations as something for us, but in a negative way. So right, saying like, these are just put here to harm us. Why does everything bad have to happen to me? And it's like the, all the world is out to get you. So this is kind of flipping it and looking like, looking at it like this is an opportunity for you rather than a negative that's trying to get in your way for a, for a negative purpose. So, like I said, we have a choice of how we regard that obstacle. And that choice makes life so much more delightful if we consider those obstacles like we would in sports as like, they're the defensive team coming up to block you as the, you move the goal, the ball toward the goal line, but we're all just playing our part in the game. And the fun part is the challenge of figuring out how to get around that so you can ultimately reach your goal. So to clarify here, as we're talking about life parkour, this is not about trivializing your life. This is not about treating life as a game and acting like really bad things don't happen. This is about the opportunities that can be created out of limitations and choosing whether you're going to remain stuck or you're going to play with the obstacles that end up in your path. So I'll give you an example of how I've learned to do that and by telling you about a couple of solo camping trips that I have taken in the last year that you might look at and think they sound disastrous, but a little attitude change makes it fun and exciting actually, even rewarding. So we're gonna rewind to last August, 2020. Sorry, my face is so itchy. There's like dust in the desert right now. Rewinding to last August, I went into the woods on a three day, two night journey. Um, if you haven't heard much about that, that trip, uh, you can hear a lot more about it in the first episode of my podcast, Walking in the Wilderness. So you can look that up if you'd like. But so on this trip, I had expectations. And don't we all, right? So expectations cause us to assume things, and at least in my case, that always sets me up for my expectations being let down, for disappointment. And so on this trip in August, I expected this blissful, peaceful getaway with the natural world, and it was going to be like kumbaya and beautiful. Um, well, within five hours, I was covered in ticks. Just, just a ton of ticks, like the baby. They were nymph ticks so all over me. <sighs> So that's not entirely an obstacle I would like to play with. I would not like to engage with that, um, even though I was there to do just that. But uh, instead, I called my husband, and he brought me some heavy-duty bug spray, and then uh, I did reluctantly go back into the forest. But the long story short about this trip, um, I, you know, there were a few things that got in my way of this blissful, peaceful journey. I had to hide from a few off-trail hikers at a few points in time. Um, the rain was not very kind to me, and even though I technically addressed these challenges in the same way by doing the same things that I would do now, my attitude was panic and disappointment and this growing fear that I wasn't going to get what I wanted to out of this trip. So I was looking at these obstacles as like straight up barriers that were keeping me stuck and limiting my experience rather than playing off of them, parkour, <laughs> rather than treating them like parkour. And I came out of it kind of traumatized and I cried for a few days because I'd been sucking up my true emotions and just thinking I just had to get through it. I wasn't trying to have fun with it. I wasn't trying to engage and find the messages through all of that. I just, I couldn't let go of what I expected things to be like. And so that disappointment and really that, I mean, it was a feeling of not feeling safe either with the ticks. But um, I didn't allow these obstacles to move me in a new direction or reshape my experience. So I was very stuck. Um, so here we go. We're going to forward, fast forward to two days ago, Sunday, when I set off on a spur of the moment overnight backpacking trip uh, to test some of my new gear and to clarify my current personal direction, personal and professional direction a little bit. So this is just a, this is a bit of a fun story. So I'm gonna tell it all, but then I'll point out the parkour moments. But what happened before I even left is that, is what made the difference here. What happened before I even left is that I said to myself, you know, this is probably gonna be hard. This isn't gonna be a like cutesy little time like I had expected the last time. I just kind of acknowledged I'm going to be tired. I know I didn't prepare well enough, so something's going to go wrong. 
<laughs> and I also knew I was only going for one night, so I would live. I knew I would live. That's that's a really great just one thing to know about the situation that will allow you to be flexible, right? You're going to live. So I walked from where I am right now. I walked. I'm on a desert ranch west of Phoenix, and I walked to a nearby campground, which is five miles away. And I walked with a new backpacking backpack to test it out for a Grand Canyon trip that Anthony and I have planned in March. And that's also our first backpacking trip. So I've never carried a pack this heavy for so long before. So I got to the park entrance. I was already in pain. I was already exhausted. The pack does not fit right. And don't worry, I got a new one since then. But I just like couldn't get the weight out of my chest and onto my pelvis where it's supposed to be. I'm adjusting, readjusting. I might have had it packed wrong, but it was so... Like, I think I strained some muscles around my rib cage. Just, ugh, awful. But, so I got there. The person checking me in at the gate says, you know there's another three miles to the campground, right? <laughs> and I did not know this, but I said, yep. I said, yep, that's, that's fine. And I, again, I had to remind myself at that point that, you know, I'm not going to die. I can choose. There are choices here. So this is my obstacle being thrown my way, all right? I can choose... Am I going to give up? Do I call Anthony to come get me? Or do I walk that last three miles and say to myself, I can do eight miles with a poorly fitted backpack, so I can do seven to nine miles a day in the canyon easily with a better fitted backpack. That's what I chose to do, by the way. So I walked. I made it to the campsite. I got there about 2.30 p.m. I set up my tent, and I started to get out my food because I really needed some sodium. I could feel like I was a little overhydrated. I hadn't taken any salt so, and I was super hungry, so figured no need to hold off till normal dinner time. And I got out my camp stove and I got out my propane. Remember, I had not prepared very well. No research, didn't do anything. And then I read the directions of my camp stove, only to find that MSR has their very own fuel that you have to use. So I did not have propane that was compatible with my camp stove. <sighs> not allowed to collect wood in this park that I was in, um, but I found like little twigs. I don't know where they came from. I've never started a fire in the desert because I grew up on the East Coast. Um, found little twigs. Was there a tree there at some point? I don't know, but I found twigs. I built like the tiniest fire for just long enough to heat up my pasta. I had like mac and cheese, gluten-free mac and cheese. Um, and got it to like soften. I never got the water to boil, but I got it to soften. And again, like this is something afterward, I'm like, I'm so tired, but like I'm eating this mac and cheese that I just worked so hard to make and it felt really good. So game one conquered, here we go. I tried then, um, I tried to do some like ritually things at night to get into my flow, but I couldn't, I was too exhausted. So I went to lay down, I was asleep by like seven. And then I woke up at 9.30 to a massive windstorm. And guys, I couldn't get my tent staked down when I got there because the ground was super hard and I was tired and I didn't bring a wooden mallet. And um, yeah, so I spent two those two hours of the windstorm on Sunday night just like shifting all my stuff around in the tent and shifting myself around in the tent to figure out where I needed to lay so that the tent would stop lifting up from the bottom. So I'm like shoved my, into a corner, keeping the two main corners that would kept flying up down and started falling asleep with the side of the tent still kind of hitting me on the back of the head. Um, but that's kind of when I thought to myself, I kind of stopped and said, okay, like this sucks. What might the wind be trying to tell me? followed by the thought of the wind isn't wind just for you. This is for the whole planet. There's no specific message for you, which is a very easy message to get sucked into. Then followed by, and if you've been following along for this talk, you may have guessed it, this play anything quote came up into my head again, that life in these obstacles become purposeful when you take things that are not meant and not created just for you and you treat them as if they were. So I was able then to start a conversation with the wind that's really actually like an internal intuitive dialogue that's just letting me express my feelings in a healthy way. And I fell asleep feeling sure that the wind was here just to remind me of the game that we were playing. Like just to remind me 
that we're here to, to do this. Like I'm here to find and conquer these obstacles. Okay, so one more fun thing happened. Um, I brought cacao. If you know, I drink my morning cacao like a half ounce. Um, and I brought two ounces to do a full ceremony yesterday. And now I had no way to heat my water because I'd used up all the little twigs that I could for my fire. But then I remembered that I brought a candle for my candle magic. So I watched the sunrise out of my tent with my little lit candle and my little metal mug held over this tiny flame and I heated my cacao until it melted. I, I think I did some successful parkour over all these obstacles that I had. So that morning, you know, before Anthony came to get me because I was not walking back, I made that resolution, I'm still sore today. I was thinking about the first people on this planet and how everything was something to figure out for them. Everything was an obstacle for them. And they had to look at everything and think, what could I do with this? What am I supposed to do with this? And how could I make this work in order to discover all of the amazing things we now have at our convenience today? And if you think about it, everything was put here for us to use somehow. So if we're listening to it, and really asking, what do you want me to do with you? Maybe we're discovering those things for ourselves, like, like the first people to walk this earth. Just a thought. So in Ian Bogos' book, he also talks about uh, one condition of fun and play, which is to meet and master a challenge. Play is not really that rewarding unless you gain some mastery that creates fulfillment for you. So because I had followed all these obstacles, such as the walk I had to take, the ways I needed to heat my food, how to respond to the winter storm, I recognized and acknowledged the struggles throughout all of that. I didn't say this is easy. I said, well, great, this is something to, to get over. This is a, an obstacle to, to jump over. Um, and so, but by recognizing it, I don't feel traumatized this time. I feel like I was able to turn toward those things instead of saying, you're not happening, I need to have the experience I planned. Um, and I feel super empowered and capable. I, I'm going to do a better job in the Grand Canyon. I'm going to prepare a lot better. Um, but, you know, I would say even this time it was actually kind of fun. So how might we use this in real life? I'll wrap up here. Um, there are so many applications that we could talk about, so many situations. So if you have one that you particularly would like feedback on, DM me, put it in the comments. Um, but I would ask you to pose one question to yourself. And that is looking at this obstacle, maybe like if it's in your head, try to separate from it and look at it as if it's on the table in front of you. Same with any of the other circumstances you're holding and say, what could I do with this? It's kind of like I'm also reminded when I have limited ingredients in the refrigerator, I say, what could I do with my cheese, my egg, my lemon juice, and some chicken? And like just make something out of, out of what you've got. Making lemonade with your lemons. All these kind of metaphors. Anyway, so how might you jump off this urban obstacle like they do in parkour? How might you respond to this barrier being in your way by using it as if it's there just for you to figure that out? So please ask yourself these questions over the next few days. Please let me know what comes up. Let me know how it goes. And I look forward to hearing about your life parkour. All right, all. And I'm so sorry. I didn't, I had to scroll down in the comments. Cool. Gina, thanks for hanging out. And Mariette, I'm guessing it's the two of you. And thank you for commenting. All right, I'm going to end. I'll see you next Tuesday.